My name is uh, Bongani Mayosi. I'm from Cape Town. I'm a cardiologist at the Hrutsky Hospital in Cape Town. And I am chair of the Rheumatic Fever Council of the World Heart Federation. Uh, and this uh, session here is probably one of the most important uh, on rheumatic heart disease, uh, which is a neglected uh, condition of poverty uh, that really needs to be brought to the attention of the public, of professionals, and, 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 and everyone in the world. Uh, we are going to uh, crack on with the program. Uh, and uh, I see uh, Professor Jonathan Karaperis uh, has just come. Uh, we are going to start by showing the video, um, uh, which is entitled Take Heart, uh, the Take Heart movie. And thereafter, Jonathan Karaperis uh, will address us. Thank you, and uh, thanks to Bongani for, for the introductions. Uh, I'm Jonathan Karapetis from the Telethon Kids Institute, and apologies for being a little bit late. It's the challenges of um, a very large convention centre. We, uh, we have today um, a number of um, fantastic speakers here. I'm going to give a very brief introduction to rheumatic heart disease and then hand over to a number of speakers who are going to talk to some of the abstracts they've presented here, but also some who um, will talk about their own experiences in their countries with rheumatic heart disease control. So rheumatic heart disease, um, very briefly, rheumatic heart disease begins as an infectious disease but very quickly becomes a chronic non-communicable disease. Uh, at its very heart is the, the beginning of um, infection of the throat with the streptococcus bacterium, the classic strep throat that kids often suffer. Uh, in some people infected by some streps, that infection, when it goes away, leaves a residual problem in the body, and that is that the immune response of the body to try and fight off that bug also damages the body itself. And that's a disease called acute rheumatic fever that might begin three weeks or so after a streptococcal throat infection. And that's a disease that causes someone to have swollen joints, fever, might cause some unusual movements known as chorea, uh, can, can very rarely cause some issues with the skin, some rashes and some lumps but most importantly can also damage the heart valves and that can lead to leaking of the heart valves. And that's a problem because it causes extra stress on the heart. A lot of those problems, in fact, all of those problems will get better eventually. They can be accelerated in terms of how quickly the child recovers by going to hospital. But what might not get better is the damage to the heart valves. And the real problem with acute rheumatic fever is that it can come back again. And the what we call recurrences of rheumatic fever, each time they can come back can damage the heart valves even more 
and that's the disease we know as rheumatic heart disease, which then can lead to complications, heart failure, can lead to stroke, to infection of the heart valves. Of obviously, in terms of options for people who have rheumatic heart disease, they get limited, especially because this is a disease of the poor. Um, and so in a country like Australia, we have the option of operating on people, of sending them many thousands of kilometres for heart valve surgery. But that's not always the case in the majority of countries of the world where this is a problem. And so all too often, the outcome is early death. We know that this is a disease that affects at least 15 million people around the world. Um, we're doing some work uh, now that suggests that it might be a much greater figure, uh, with at least 233,000 deaths per year. The latest global burden of disease estimates put the figures much higher, 34 million cases, 345,000 deaths per year. The truth is some, probably somewhere around that, and we're trying to refine those estimates. Uh, this is a huge problem. But the big thing is at the bottom. Almost all of these cases and deaths occur in the poorest populations of the world. It's a disease that up until recently has been essentially neglected because it occurs amongst the poor. Uh, and it's a disease that therefore leads to enormous pain, suffering, early death and lost productivity as well as the economic costs in continents such as Africa, in Asia, in the Pacific, in our region, and of course in Australia and New Zealand in our indigenous populations and other um, immigrants who've come from other populations. The big other point to make is that this is a disease that is eminently preventable. And we're going to hear about some of the strategies to prevent this disease. And we should be doing a lot more about this disease around the world. Uh, the challenges mainly around implementing what we know works. Uh, the, the, one of the oldest antibiotics we have, penicillin, is at the cornerstone of both what we call primary prevention and secondary prevention. There are many other strategies that can be used, and obviously at, the, at, at its heart, because this is a disease of poverty, of social injustice, things like uh, overcrowded housing and poor quality housing are a priority, and we'll probably hear from about some of the initiatives from New Zealand that have been trying to tackle that. Um, for us, it's a matter of particularly raising awareness, advocating for the importance of this disease. The funding is important, but we're talking about relatively small amounts of funding compared to the size of the problem and the ability to make an impact. And that's something that we need to be moving to, towards in the next year or two. So um, that's rheumatic heart disease in a nutshell. We, you'll learn more about this as we go through some of the individual presentations. So I'm going to ask now to Samantha Cahoon, who's a research fellow at the Centre for International Child Health um, at the Murdoch Children's Research Institute and the University of Melbourne, to come up and um, talk to her uh, ab her abstract, which is Insights from the Pacific Rheumatic Heart Disease Prevention and Control Program. Sam, thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, everybody, for inviting me. Um, so I was going to present with Titus Nassi from the Solomon Islands, but he's actually caught up in another meeting, so he sends his apologies. Um, so a little bit of outline for this program. It's a program in the Pacific region. Um, to expand capacity among Pacific Island nations to deliver comprehensive pro register-based programs to address um, the high levels of rheumatic heart disease and rheumatic fever in the Pacific. Um, before 2005, there were no programs in, no consolidated programs in virtually all countries in the Pacific, though anecdotally a very high burden of disease that um, clinicians were seeing. So in 2005, work was commenced um, with backing from the World Heart Federation initially um, to set up two demonstration sites, which were um, with the Ministries of Health in Fiji and Samoa, to develop um, a model, I guess, that could help them address the issues in their country, for finding a comprehensive program and then expanding elsewhere in the Pacific. And in 2008, some assistance was given to Tonga to do so. And Tonga and Samoa became quickly autonomous um, for a while, the program was without any funding, but continued on. And then we were lucky enough to get an AusAid grant um, in 2011 that gave us three years of funding to help four other island nations, Kiribati, Nauru, Tuvalu, and the Solomon Islands, to, um, in all cases, virtually, to commence RHD and rheumatic fever control programs. Um, the program also provides external technical and resource support across the Asia-Pacific region and um, training support as much as we can, but a lot of that is done remotely. So the four country program that's um, underway now and due to complete in July this year, um, 
It's three years of funding and it was in partnership with ministries of health in the four countries I mentioned. And the aim was to commence or expand RHD prevention and control to define baseline burden of disease. So although we knew that clinicians in those countries were reporting seeing a lot of patients, they actually didn't have good data to go to their ministries and say this is a priority disease. So it's very important to have some understanding of how much this disease impacts the population and what parts of the population, because as Jonathan highlighted, it is a highly preventable disease. And also the other main aim of the project was to build capacity in the healthcare workforce to diagnose, detect, manage the disease, and also to improve health information systems. So very briefly, some results um, from a baseline of no programs in um, all countries and just a baseline d disease register in two countries that was very new anyway. Um, all four of those countries now have national uh, RHD registers. They all have baseline RHD prevalence data. There's been um, great successes, I guess, in RHD um, training of healthcare professionals and uh, can, uh, colleagues from all of those countries came to a train the trainer workshop and um, took home packages and now delivering training workshops in their own countries. Um, three of the four co countries now have national RHD strategies. Um, we've seen improved benzathine, which is the um, benzathine penicillin, the treatment, we've seen improved adherence take up in children, particularly in the children that were screened as part of the RHD screening prevalence studies. Um, much too early to see uh, improvements in medication adherence in older people, but there, we feel that there is an increased diagnostic capacity in the local teams and certainly increased awareness among health professionals. So working in this region is very, very challenging for the, the countries because they have very fragile health systems. Often countries are very remote, and particularly these countries that we work in have multi-island, small populations on multi-island atolls, that sometimes a boat only comes once a month, and sometimes that boat gets held up, so it might be once every two months. There's, um, they're very vulnerable to climate change. Solomon Islands is under a state of emergency at the moment, as you may be aware, because of flooding. There's lots of communication transport issues. There's many, many competing disease priorities. Um, and so to get forward with really needs increased integration across all areas of um, the health system through child health, through non-communicable diseases. Um, and I guess to do that, rather than tasking these ministries of health and clinicians with more jobs saying you must do this, they really need support. And as Jonathan said, not large funding, but sustained funding over a long period of time to get there. So um, the biggest challenge for us, I guess, working in the region is we get constant um, requests for help and assistance that were very dependent on program grants that are highly competitive and they're generally very short term. So going forward, we really need a regional strategy and engagement and prioritisation and which of course, some funding. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Um, now, what we're gonna do is move through, I don't think we'll take questions after each speaker, we'll save our questions to the end. Um, so I'm going to move now to Bongani Mayosi, um, who you've met. He's the professor and head of Department of Medicine at the University of Cape Town. Um, and then we're going to talk uh, here from Chrissy Picken, who's the chief advisor of the Ministry of uh, chief advisor in the Ministry of Health in New Zealand, about the concept of national action plans against rheumatic heart disease. Bongani, do you want to go yeah. first? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it, it is clear that um, the countries that have been successful in reducing the burden of rheumatic fever and rheumatic heart disease are those that have had a coordinated national plan to deal with this problem. Uh, and, and we have many, many examples of that where countries have started, they've had a plan, and, and, and they've shown some success. Uh, and, uh, and this starts way back actually in the late 60s, uh, in Cuba, uh, in, uh, in the early 70s, in, in Costa Rica, in the 80s, in uh, the French islands of uh, Guadeloupe and, and Martinique, and, and much more recently, actually, uh, in, in Tunisia, right, who started with their program, perhaps in the mid-80s, uh, and, and have now managed to deal with the problem of rheumatic fever and rheumatic heart disease in, the, in their populations. We, 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 we agree that development itself is what is needed ultimately. You need to improve people's social conditions to deal with this problem fundamentally. But that is hard, and that, is, that has been the work of many, many other development agencies. And whilst waiting for development to occur, countries can, in fact, 
implement programs uh, uh, that can reduce this problem. And in studying those programs that have succeeded, they appear to have four elements uh, that are required to make them succeed. The first element is that of awareness raising, of education. And that applies to the population, where the population must be aware that sore throat could be linked to heart disease, uh, so that mothers or with small children, young children, can take them to the clinic when they've got heart disease. Educating the nurses and the doctors uh, to handle uh, those children properly were presenting to the clinic with sore throat, uh, particularly the issue of treatment with penicillin. Educating doctors and nurses about how to handle those who've had rheumatic fever already who need to be on penicillin for a long time to prevent further attacks of sore throat. So education and training is key, is a key first step. And then the second uh, important step, obviously, is that of measurement, is that of surveillance by countries. Many countries did have registers uh, to monitor the amount of disease in the population and monitor that it's coming down. Notification has been one of the tools. Uh, so surveillance has been key. And then thirdly, the health system itself. It's very important. Actually, this, is, this issue is about primary health care. It's about advocating for there to be care uh, for, uh, for people who are affected with this particular condition. So there's medical treatment uh, for those who are affected. Uh, um, uh, so advocacy is very important. And finally, uh, to make sure that there is a clear program of primary and secondary prevention with penicillin in the countries. In the African region, we've called this uh, the ASAP approach, awareness raising, surveillance, advocacy, and prevention. And, uh, uh, and we are working, um, we we're working with a few countries initially, but now we're working through uh, WHO Afro to help countries develop programs uh, that uh, will be effective. Each country will be slightly different from the other, but their principles are the same. And what has happened much more uh, in this meeting, as some of you will know, is that a, 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 a toolkit has been developed um, under the auspices of the World Heart Federation, uh, uh, working with a, an Australian organization called REACH to produce a, a toolkit with the technical information that is required to assist the ministries to do what, what needs to be done. So at this level, uh, at this point uh, in this campaign, we're very, very optimistic that we're likely to make progress because the awareness, I think, about this condition is, is rising and we're beginning to be much better, much more coordinated and to have the, the, the right tools to do this. So, um, so, so that, is, uh, that, that is what is happening. Uh, and uh, in Africa, when in the early stages, only a few countries are implementing programs. Sudan is uh, probably uh, one of the countries that, that is ahead of the others, and Egypt, uh, and, and perhaps Africa to a certain extent. Uh, but um, over the next few years, we're hoping that we're going to see an acceleration of countries that adopt programs. Uh, that follow the example of Tunisia and other places that have dealt with this problem. So, so those are the, uh, the, the main points uh, that we will need governments uh, to, uh, uh, to, to take charge of this problem and have national action plans. Uh, and uh, I will hand over to my colleague from uh, New Zealand, which is uh, New Zealand is, uh, is really an example, a shining example to all of us on, on, on how to tackle this problem as, uh, at a governmental level. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, we in New Zealand have had a program such as uh, Bongani describes for several decades, thanks to people like uh, Professor Diana Lennon here. Um, but although the rates really reduced, they didn't go away. We still had a level four times higher than you would expect of rheumatic fever. Uh, for a country such as ours with the level of income, and as you can see from this slide, was actually starting to increase again. So the New Zealand uh, government then, as part of its better public service, set a very ambitious target for us to reduce this by two-thirds uh, by June 2017. And uh, remarkably has uh, really backed that up with a huge investment um, to help us achieve that target. Uh, the target is really important as well because it isn't just a health service target, it's actually a whole of government target and that has allowed us to start looking at the real underlying conditions that are leading to this high rate in New Zealand. 
Um, so it's led to a whole uh, raft of new initiatives, uh, putting together a really comprehensive, innovative program with a whole range uh, of initiatives. Um, as we've Bongani's talked about the importance of raising awareness. Uh, we do have a communications campaign that we launched last week, um, and we provide, in the middle of uh, providing online learning modules for all our health professionals. Many of our GPs who come over to New Zealand uh, actually have come from Europe, have been trained in Europe, and have never seen uh, this condition of rheumatic fever and rarely has seen uh, rheumatic heart disease, certainly not in children. So we need to teach them about this. We also talked about access to primary care uh, and uh, in that we provide that through two main approaches, a school-based program which provides sore throat identification and treatment in schools in high-risk communities. But also we've recently set up 79 free dropping clinics in high-risk areas because it's a big ass to ask poor communities to take their children to have every sore throat checked. And unfortunately, uh, primary care is not free in uh, New Zealand for uh, all children. And so we need to make it as easy as possible uh, for them. But 90% of our cases are in Maori and Pacific uh, children and young people. But they're not born vulnerable <coughs> to this uh, disease. The reason it's so high is the lack of access to primary care, which we've talked about, which we are addressing in the government, but also a higher burden of sore throats through higher rates of household crowding. So a flagship initiative that we've, we are trialling in Auckland uh, is aiming to prevent the sore throats happening in the first place or the excess burden uh, happening in the first place. So this service brings together a whole range of local uh, health, housing, government, non-government uh, people to work together to identify low-income families with children at risk of rheumatic fever who are living in crowded circumstances and works with them to put together a package of interventions to reduce that crowding. And that includes a fast track to rehousing by social housing, uh, provides insulation and curtains to keep the house warm, household repairs, provision of grants and loans for heating sources, beds, financial literacy advice to help them uh, manage the limited resources they have, and housing literacy advice to help them understand how to negotiate with landlords, etc., to get repairs done. Um, so all of these new initiatives are... Uh, also uh, brought together in every one of our district health boards in a high-risk area has to have a rheumatic fever prevention plan and I think that's an important element of any program getting really clear uh, who needs to be responsible uh, for what um, if you advocate for change you need to be able to tell people what change we expect of them and to hold them to account for that so these are all our uh, new initiatives. Uh, most of them are relatively recent, so we haven't been able to translate those into change in terms of rheumatic fever hospital admissions yet, but we're very hopeful that not only will we be able to do that, but in that process, work out which of these works best in our circumstances, and then be able to uh, work with the world community about how we might be able to translate some of those into resource poor communities and countries. Thank you, Chrissy. Um, we're now going to move on to uh, two <coughs> further speakers who've presented abstracts at this meeting, um, and, and a natural segue from uh, that discussion from Chrissy Pickin is to move to <coughs> Professor Diana Lennon uh, from the Department of Paediatrics at the University of Auckland, uh, who has been an international leader in rheumatic fever for quite some time and uh, has, as Chrissy said, been a driving force behind the amazing investment in New Zealand. So, Diana, over to you, please. Thank you, Jonathan. 
you may ask, why New Zealand? And that's been a big issue that I think then helps understand and inform on what happens in other countries. Rheumatic fever and rheumatic heart disease is a child health indicator. It's not a one disease wonder. It should be embedded any efforts into a program for children. Skin disease, injury prevention, and that's where New Zealand is eventually moving, we hope. We've started with this disease because it's a disease with a long shadow. Cases in childhood, sore throats, cases of rheumatic fever, heart disease that then persists into adult life and people die young. Economies are, are disadvantaged by young adults dying young. So in New Zealand, before we had government backing, we got a database together to say, let's do what we can do first, embedded into the already existing nursing system. And we started to prevent rheumatic fever recurrences, because each time you get rheumatic fever, your heart gets worse, and then you're going to die younger, or you need surgery if your country can afford it. So we got that database going, we drove that down. Then we said, where to from here? The New Zealand health community said, where's the evidence? So we said, OK, we have to provide the evidence. So we did a very big trial about school-based access to primary health care because, as Chrissy Pickens said, it was poor and expensive in New Zealand. And then we have moved on from that with guidelines for our health professionals who've been quite cynical along the line, I have to say, melding up a nursing workforce and a community health worker workforce. And this has now come together with this very big important government initiative that New Zealand is now spearheading. So our particular contribution at this meeting was then to try and put together data based on the approach we had way back in the 80s where we had a register of kids who we wanted to get onto penicillin and then we have grown that with a case definition and very careful sourcing of data from all sources to see what we can see at the end of this wonderful New Zealand government approach, have we made a difference? So our data is as clean as we can manage it. We have the possibility in a developed country, of course, of all sorts of resources. So we're not a developing country, but we have a population who carries a burden of many of these preventable infectious diseases. So we hope that our particular situation can help and inspire other countries, because some way along the line, we've not necessarily had huge resources to spend on this, but have used what we already had. Thank you. Thank you, Jonah. That's fantastic. Um, so our last speaker today is going to be Professor Krishna Kumar, who is Head of Department of Paediatric Cardiology at the Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences in India, and has been involved in the Indian approach to rheumatic heart disease for some time. So uh, it's a slightly different story, I think. Okay, okay. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, certainly, it is a very different story. And um, I'm here, actually, although I've represent an institution. I'm here uh, as, a, as having been a part of a very large, perhaps one of the largest uh, collective efforts to collect data on rheumatic heart disease on a nationwide scale, involving uh, well over 10 million people. Uh, Dr. Meenakshi Sharma, who is from the Indian Council of Medical Research, is here. And uh, she essentially was a part of the coordination of this uh, pretty ambitious initiative that happened between 2000 and 2010. The challenges of uh, trying to control rheumatic heart disease and rheumatic fever in India are understandably enormous. And it's probably because, firstly, the magnitude, uh, the disease burden in India is quite definitely the largest in the world simply because of the enormity of the population and also of the fact that there are many regions in India where the disease is prevalent. So the magnitude in itself is a, an, an extraordinary challenge. And additionally, uh, the other challenge is, is the diversity, is the fact that there are parts of India where the disease has almost gone away, such as where I am in Kerala, and there are parts where it is as bad as sub-Saharan Africa. So to come up with a policy that can actually be implemented on a nationwide scale becomes really hard because there isn't a widely perceived uniform disease burden. So you need to really to target efforts to those parts of the country where the disease is prevalent. So the study that um, the Indian Council of Medical Research undertook was really to provide a framework for the, for the Ministry of Health in India 
to come up with a plan uh, to first determine the disease burden and then to come up with a policy. The government of India, the Ministry of Health, is only now working towards a national plan. There isn't a national plan yet, but there is an attempt, there is an effort towards trying to come up with a national plan. And the Indian Council of Medical Research, hopefully the data that we've collected during the study, can provide some kind of a guideline. But what I'm here to talk to you about is really how we've tried in one state, one state of Punjab, because where we had a champion who took the data and the experience of setting up a registry and tried to then upscale it on a statewide level. And it's this experience that I'm actually going to share with you. Um, it's an ongoing process. And the efforts were that of Dr. Rajesh Kumar, whom you know very well. Um, can I just see the next slide? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So this is the state of Punjab, which actually is by no means uh, one of the poorer parts of the country. It's in fact one of the really better uh, be uh, parts of the country with better resources. So this district of Rupnagar is where Dr. Rajesh set up the registry as a part of our national project that was initiated by the ICMR. So this was the one million population where the registry was initiated, where the network was created. And what he has actually tried to do is use the experience of having created this then to create a statewide implementation program. And I'm going to show this, and maybe this in some ways could serve as a model for the rest of the country, recognizing, of course, there are diff differences between various states that we have to come to terms with. So he, he has actually created an organizational framework which essentially involves maintaining a main register at the government hospital of the district headquarters and then have primary health centers, community health centers, and civil hospitals, and selected private health providers who volunteer to, to maintain sub-registers of patients in their particular region. And then through regular school health service, through cardiac auscultation, uh, and a number of kids are being picked up through this process, both congenital and rheumatic. So there's one beneficiary of this whole system that you actually take care of congenital heart disease in older children as well. And then cases reported to community. So there has been an intense awareness campaign uh, on the same lines that, that, as that was established in, in that particular district or at a statewide level. So that would allow a, a much higher level of reporting. And then uh, this is one state where penicillin has been available and the penicillin usage has been far more easy uh, and more widely accepted than, than in many other parts of the country. So he maintained that there are penicillin profile access records that are maintained. So this process hopefully would allow uh, an excellent surveillance system and a much improved profile access. There isn't enough emphasis on primary profile access yet on this particular project, but just by improving awareness, it's hoped that that, that would also be achieved. So this is essentially the, uh, the organizational framework where there is a nodal officer who is uh, informed and made responsible at the Directorate of Health Services in Punjab, and then there is a nodal officer at every district, and that's just part of the healthcare system that prevails there. And there's a medical officer that is assigned to screen school children. Uh, it's just a simple auscultation screening. That's what is realistic. And, uh, and then uh, all hospitals are made to enroll and create registers. Suspected cases are encouraged to be investigated through whatever resources that are available. And echocardiograms are provided at medical colleges that are uh, in, in reasonable number in the state so that you do have the echo service as well. And there is an undertaking, the government has actually undertaken to fund treatment of all school children who have got diseases diagnosed through this process. So tertiary care is provided at the Postgraduate Institute of Medical Research where Dr. Rajesh Kumar is, and Dayanand Medical College in Ludhiana, which is also a very well-equipped institution for free treatment and surgery, which is funded by the government. So this is the framework that we think can be then done at a national level. Of course, there are going to be differences. There are going to be major regional differences that we'll have to come to terms with. So there's going to be a requirement of engagement of health authorities in 
various states. And that's the challenge that we have to overcome. Thank you. Thank you, KK. So before I open for questions, just a couple of concluding comments. Um, this area of rheumatic heart disease is certainly a, a Congress like this at last getting the attention it deserves. Um, and we now have uh, a situation where really it's been one of the most prominent parts of the program. You've heard speakers today from three continents, uh, but in fact, we have representatives here from pretty much every continent speaking on rheumatic heart disease. We know it's an ongoing issue in Latin America. We've heard about that, uh, particularly in the, if you like, the underserved areas, but in places like Brazil. Uh, we know that it's an issue, very prominent issue in the um, former Soviet republics of Central Asia, uh, where there's been remarkable rises in rheumatic heart disease associated with the social disruption as the Soviet Union fell. We know it's an ongoing problem in, in the states of the Middle East, um, and of course the hot spots of the world that you've heard from today, particularly um, Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh and the like. Um, and of course, in our part of the world, we know it's a major issue in the Pacific um, and in the um, indigenous populations, particularly in Australia and New Zealand. So we're learning more about the disease, but what's very, I think, exciting from our point of view is that we are now focusing on systems-wide approaches to try and tackle the disease. We still have work to do, but we particularly have work to do to raise awareness um, and to particularly uh, try and influence the decision makers, the policy makers, uh, to do the sort of things that we're seeing in a country like New Zealand to try and get it on the agenda elsewhere. So with that, I'll open for any questions. Please. It's, I guess, a bit of a side issue, but I'm wondering if antibiotic resistance is, is, an all, is it all an issue with the treatment of rheumatic heart Sorry, I have to use the microphone. Um, um, it's a side issue, but I'm wondering if antibiotic resistance is an issue at all with this disease. Diana, do you want to talk to that? It's a, it's a particularly intriguing situation we have. The strep bug, Streptococcus pyogenes, is universally and globally sensitive to penicillin. We have no idea why, and long may it last. So the major issue for penicillin is we use it to prevent recurrent attacks with, with monthly injections, and then it is also treating the strep bug that causes the sore throats, which is what's called the primary prevention. So it's a special situation. The New Zealand and Australian governments have been looking very actively at getting it together a consortium, hopefully to trial at least one vaccine, perhaps two or three, and Jonathan may want to add to that. It's um, progressing. Well, in fact, uh, what I can tell you is that the, the initiative that was announced about a year and a half ago is finally getting underway, and, and this is very exciting. The two governments are getting together to saying, we want a rheumatic fever vaccine. They've put some money on the table. Um, I think the contracts are about to be signed to get this initiated. Three vaccines will be looked at, and that includes one vaccine uh, that's being developed by Professor Michael Good in Queensland, another vaccine that's being developed in the United States, and a further vaccine that's being developed in Europe. Our plan is to evaluate those three vaccines in the first stage, uh, again, between the two countries, to determine whether any or all of them look promising enough to then uh, hopefully provide further funding to get them into clinical trials. Uh, this is an incredibly exciting development, and for the first time in uh, the 20 years I've been involved in rheumatic fever, I feel I feel like we are making progress, that we can realistically talk about a vaccine on the horizon, but let's not be deluded. We are talking about vaccines that are only now just being given to people for the first time, and we know that even if one of those turns out to be the right vaccine, it's many years until that vaccine is out there, and then there are further challenges to make sure it gets to the populations that need them the most. So while we're working on them, we can't be diverted by that. There's a lot we can do in the meantime, the sort of things you've heard about today. Are there any further questions? Yes, please. Uh, it is most affected. Say it again. What are the areas most affected? What are the areas? The areas most affected. Ages. Oh, the ages. Okay. Um, Pongani, do you want yeah. to deal with it? Yes. So when it comes to strep infection, a, a strep throat, uh, it, is, it is a disease of childhood in the first 
10 to 15 years of life. Uh, that, that's the highest risk group. And then rheumatic fever can start as young as the age of four or five, uh, but uh, it, it is uh, commonly a, a, a disease, again, of childhood uh, with a peak around the age of perhaps 12 or 15. And then rheumatic heart disease, which is the consequence of neglected rheumatic fever, uh, starts appearing uh, a, a little later, perhaps in your late teens, early 20s, although in the countries of the world with the highest incidence of the disease, we've seen rheumatic heart valve disease in kids as young as four years of age. So, um, uh, so, 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 so that's, uh, that, that, that's the, um, uh, uh, those are the age groups. The key point though is that this is a disease of the whole life course, right? Uh, starting in childhood with complications appearing much later in life. What should GPs, general practitioners, be telling their patients when they bring their children for strep throat? Okay, okay. do you want to fill that one? So, um, when a patient presents to a general practitioner, it's often not evident it's a strep throat, and that, that needs to be figured out. And it's often, uh, there is a very nice uh, algorithm that has been developed in South Africa where it's possible to say that the odds that it's streptococcal or bacterial is, is much higher based on certain clues that you get from physical examination. And based on those clues, uh, you can say the odds are pretty high it's bacterial. And if you use antibiotics in those patients, then uh, from a public health perspective, that works very well in preventing uh, rheumatic fever. It's more cost effective than trying to determine the presence of strep through specific tests, which may not be feasible on a large scale. Diana, did you want to speak to the New Zealand um, perspective on that? It's difficult to separate out the issues in this. The predicting test that KK is talking about is is good but not 100%. Yes. And so if you live in a country where you have healthcare with laboratory facilities and that's what your rich population expects, then you've got to make the decision about how you might treat the kids who are at risk of rheumatic fever and their sore throats. And this is a dichotomy that richer countries have to consider. And so currently in New Zealand, we're actually on the equipoise of discussing this quite actively because the burden of pathological tests in a laboratory growing the bug from the sore throat swab is very large. But the, prediction, the predictive tests are flawed. You either over-treat or under-treat. And there are risks in both. There are risks if you've got lots of rheumatic fever, if you under-treat, the sore throat, the strep throat, but there are risks as you, if you over-treat because not every practitioner will use appropriate antibiotics and you'll be driving an antibiotic resistance if you're not just using penicillin. So it's, it's typical <coughs> of medicine, it's, there's no black and white. <coughs> the, the policy in South Africa, uh, the national guideline, uh, is to say that for children who come from high risk communities for rheumatic fever, uh, and, and in South Africa it's actually 90% of the children uh, who come from poor, poor neighborhoods. Uh, in, those, in that setting, uh, the advice to the health practitioners is that if a child is complaining of sore throat, they get treated for, for rheumatic fever, well, for, for strep throat unless there's something that is completely against that. So that the default in our uh, health system is to treat for sore throat, is, is to treat as if it is, uh, it is, rheumatic, uh, it is rheumatic fever. Um, it, it, is strep, it is strep pharyngitis. And, and there are early signs suggesting that that, that might be working, uh, particularly in urban areas. There are studies uh, in the community of Soweto uh, which, uh, which show that uh, over the past 20 years, since the expansion of primary health care services and better access, in fact, there was free health care uh, uh, for, for children and, and, and mothers who are pregnant, uh, the, the, the rates of rheumatic fever in those urban communities have come down. 
Uh, of course, we can't attribute that just to that policy. Uh, it's been accompanied with improvement in social conditions of, 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 those, of those particular com communities. So it's a fairly complex in in intervention. Uh, we have not seen um, problems with increasing resistance with the use of penicillin. The key is use penicillin. So use penicillin. We've, we've, we've not seen that. What, the problem we've seen is fear among the nurses and doctors to give the penicillin. And there, you need a lot of training and more training to, to make sure that doctors are giving an injection rather than, and, and our approach is to give the injection rather than pills. Because if you give an injection, it's just one injection when they're in front of you and uh, the problem is taken care of. Are there any other questions? Mm -hmm. What if patients are allergic to penicillin? Um, I, I can say something about that. Penicillin allergy we know is incredibly rare and there's been some very good studies on this um, published during the 1990s that have looked at um, hundreds of thousands of injections and found that uh, this is a disease that occurs is it one every 30,000, one every 60,000 mm. in terms of a severe allergy. So it's incredibly rare. Having said that, it is always a concern um, and there have been parts of the world, and there are right now parts of the world, where they have been documenting what is believed to be severe reactions to penicillin, possibly severe allergy, and even some fatalities have occurred. Uh, and this has led to real problems in terms of confidence in the system. Um, we right now are concerned that in fact these are not true penicillin allergies. It would be remarkable if they were. Uh, because we, there's no evidence that penicillin allergy itself really varies markedly or is on the rise. We are concerned more about the quality of the, pe the, pen the penicillin that's being used and whether in fact these are not related to true penicillin allergy but due to some either reaction or some impurities to other components because the quality and the supply of this product which is largely made in, um, if you like, by gene generic manufacturers is of some concern, and that's an issue that we are currently taking on and trying to tackle in a big way. Did anyone else want to speak to that? I guess, uh, yes, just emphasising that the fact that there is a shortage of such an important uh, drug and for such a widespread condition is something the whole world, I think, should be concerned about and, and something that is shameful uh, for the whole world, really, and we do really need to address that. Thank you. Are there any other questions? If not, I thank you for your attention. I just also want to point out, um, in addition to thanking the panellists, I want to thank Mike Hill, who's in the back row, from Moonshine Productions who produced the Take Heart movie, which was premiered, had its world premiere at the opening ceremony of this conference. Um, it's, you saw a, a very short version of what, say, a much more, uh, a, a longer but very moving documentary about rheumatic heart disease um, that has a global perspective, but this version had also a real focus in this part of the world. But there is a plan to produce three more of these movies that um, are based in Asia, in Africa, and Latin America. Uh, and it's a project that really, from our point of view, is helping to raise the profile of this disease around the world and is a very important tool for us. So thank you, Mike. Um, thanks to all the speakers. Thank you for your attention.